I got a timer here, guys. 30 minutes. All right. That's how it's going to flow, okay? Um, my name is Michael Roush. You can pull out your Bibles. I want you to pull out your notebooks, pull out your pens, write a few things down because you're going to be doing some research on your own. Is that all right? I expect you're already doing research on your own. Amen. Hallelujah. While you're getting your stuff out, um, there's been a lot of good stuff this weekend. Um, haven't you agreed? Yeah. All right. Let me get my notebook out. Um, hold on a second. Should have brought it up here. Okay. So we've had a lot of good sessions. Um, Drew started us off really well. And uh, I was just really floored by the, the passage from John about the blind man, and I've read it numerous times. How many of you guys re have read through the Bible one time? All right. Not as many hands as I'd, I'd expect. All right. Um, again, I, I tell you guys, you got to get into the Word of God. Um, it's a safeguard. I've read through John numerous times. Um, every year I go through the Bible. And that's not a bragging fest. That's a necessary thing. If you guys want to stay close to God and keep yourself from uh, worshiping false gods or being distracted by the world, you've got to stay in the Word every day. That's a daily thing. All right. Um, so John started us off. Um, there's so much stuff there. Um, I, I really, after, after a... Jeffrey le ended last night. I wish we would have ended last night, you know, quite honestly. I was really blessed um, by his, his teaching and everything in between, quite honestly. Um, I'm sure you guys have taken notes, gotten things down. Um, I want you to write a few scriptures down for me after, we, um, after I get to that point. But I want to tell you guys right off the get-go, uh, ask you guys a few questions. Is it possible that after all the teaching and all the things that have gone on, that you and I have still not seen God work after this whole weekend? Is it possible for somebody to not have seen God work in their lives? And the obvious answer is yes, unfortunately. We, we have to purpose to come to meet him. All right, we've purposed to come here, but sometimes even in the purposing to come to a retreat, even the purposing of paying $145 to come to a retreat, maybe it's not your money, but nevertheless, it was a purpose that you had to come to hopefully meet God, but some, some, some of my kids want to come to the retreat because we haven't been there for two years, all right? We haven't had the opportunity. COVID happened. Is it possible that even after all of the teachings on worship, we still haven't worshiped God deliberately and acceptably? Is it possible? And sadly to say, it's still possible. We can do all that we do, sing, do, pray, talk, interact, play, and go from here no different, no changed from when we started. And that's the sad state of a lot of us. You know, we get distracted by the things of this world and other things. So, you know, one thing I don't want you to take away from this, this is a heavy topic, you know, if I were to go into great detail, False or unacceptable worship is not the fun thing to talk about. You know, I, I would much rather talk about some other um, peppier topics, you know, make us all do backflips out, back, back out of here. 
So I don't want you to overanalyze yourselves after this. I don't want you to be overly critical of yourselves after this. Understand yourself as a journey, a process, a work under construction. I love the retreat shirt that says unfinished. I went to a coffee shop and I had the unfinished shirt on. You guys know that one? Who has it? Unfinished? And, I, and the lady said, looked at my shirt and she took about like two minutes. She says, oh, I get it. <laughs> uh, you're unfinished, it's not finished. And so then we tried to look at the letters that were uh, finished of the unfinished and it was an inter interesting conversation. But we are all unfinished. You guys are in a, a stage of life and you're in the journey, you're on the road Hopefully you're headed on the right road. Because you're here, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Um, hopefully you're on the right road. But sadly enough, you know, a percentage of you, a large percentage of you, will walk another direction. It was pretty hard for me to come up here and teach today. Um, I talked to Drew. Raise your hand, Drew. Praise the Lord for godly men. Um, he taught us this, this, this week. Um, some, some of you guys I look at and you're a representation of somebody in my life that's chosen differently. Um, and I don't want that. And God is a jealous God. He doesn't want that more than I don't want that. So we've talked a lot about false gods. We've talked a lot about true gods being worshipped in a false way, false gods being wor worshipped in a false way, like um, the idol that was presented before the Israelites, when Moses went away. We talked about that false God worship, how they worshiped, they were trying to worship God, but they put a false idol in place because Moses wasn't there. I, one of my favorite stories uh, is, uh, it's not my favorite story, but I, I remember a lesson that I heard from uh, this on, by John Corson called Strange Fire. And, uh, that particular story uh, really affected me. And that is something that I'm not going to really focus on too much. I really want to focus in on some other things. So while you have your stuff, I want you to write down these verses because you're going to do some s studying on your own. Exodus 32. Write down Exodus 32. Leviticus 10, 1 to 2. Exodus 32. Huh? Leviticus 10, 1 to 2. You do not have to spell it correctly. All right. Just put Lev. 10, 1 to 2. 1 Samuel 13, 8 to 14. 2 Samuel 6. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'll repeat 1 Samuel 13, 8 to 14. That's going to be about Saul. And when he brought before the Israelites the sacrifice when he shouldn't have, when Samuel should have. 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 9. Matthew 15, 1 to 9. Matthew 15, 1 to 9. Matt. Yeah. And then Matthew 23, 23 to 28. All right. So just as I 
said those things. The first one will be on the Israelites before the golden calf. Leviticus 10 to 1, 1 to 2 is Nadab and Abihu and the strange fire that they presented before the Lord. Um, Uzzah is 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 9. 1 Samuel 13, 8 to 14 is Saul when he chose to do the sacrifice instead of Samuel. But the part of this section that I really wanted to focus in on is worshiping the true God with a wrong attitude. With a wrong attitude. All right? We come before the Lord and we sing praises to him. We come before him to hear from God's word. And we oftentimes don't come full-heartedly. We come before him with distractions. And we come before him with concerns. We got heavy things on our hearts. And those things are real. Okay? But the distractions can be used by Satan to actually get us off track to not receive all that he wants for us in this next 15 minutes. All right. When I was going to, on, on a mission trip to Peru, um, actually, I'm going to back up. When I was in college, I was in a, in a group uh, called Campus Crusade, um, not Campus Crusade, Central Christian Fellowship. And I had some good friends that I ran track and cross country with, with and so I actually played basketball with one of my guys that I ran the 800 meter with. And we were fairly good friends, but we were very competitive, you know, so much so that we'd play basketball almost overly aggressively. So the cross country runners used to play two court basketball. Instead of playing one court basketball, we'd take two courts and make it a distance event type thing. So he and I would, would uh, play together with the rest of the team, but we got into an argument. We were about the same size, same physical stature, and we got in an altercation. We started fighting on the basketball court. Uh, and literally, like it turned into boxing out to like nearly fist to fist, um, fist to face type stuff. Um, I was a Christian, all right? Uh, but. Uh, he and I were still friends, but I still had this anger from that day. So I went to, guess what? I went, not counselor. I went to, I went to church that night. We went to Wednesday service. And, and he was at the same service. <laughs> I sat in the front. He sat in the back. All right. And, and it was, guess what? Communion service. And so we were worshiping the Lord and praising his name. I loved lifting my hands to the Lord. I love closing my eyes to worship because I don't like to look at the lyrics on the, on the screen. They distract me a little bit. So, but then I closed my eyes, lifted my hands, and all of a sudden I see his face in my, in my, in my mind. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> Corey, what are you doing there? What are you doing in my mind? God put him there. God put his face in my mind. Not as a distraction, but as something to take care of. Right? Can you guys say amen? Amen. 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 Every one of you guys have had something like that where you are in the middle of something and all of a sudden, boom, you've got to face something that's internally conflicting you between you and God. God won't let you get past that, hands down. And if you do get past it, I'm sad for you because that emphasizes the hardness of your heart. And I had a hard heart because I wanted, I wanted to stick it out, worship, close my eyes, lift my hands, and uh, take communion. But... As, it, as God would have it, he said, you're not going to take communion. You're not going to give an offering. You're not going to do anything until you go talk to Corey. So I, I said, okay, we'll see how that works. And about one minute later, God had me crying. Um, I walked out 
of the front row out to the back row and looked at him and I didn't even have to say too many words. I started to give him a hug. I said, I apologize. I didn't know that this was something that was going to keep me from doing this, but God made sure I talked to you and asked your forgiveness, irregardless of who did the wrong. Fast forward, mission trip, Peru, 1989, probably before most of you were born. All right, uh, I, was on a, I, I was on a mission trip. I had an earring in, in my ear, a um, little cross earring. Um, I had a big mullet, so uh, there I am. I was on the mission field. I was ready to ser serve the Lord and share the gospel and preach the, the truth to the Peruvians, all right? And I come out of the plane into a sanctuary, well, off the tarmac, of course, and into the city and go to the place where we were going to stay, drop my bags, then we go right to the place where there's worship happening, and there's a, a, a praise band up, up front uh, singing, in, singing praises in Spanish, which I was okay in Spanish, but I didn't really have the total language down. Um, so, so here I am. I'm in the back row. There's nobody in the whole place but our team of four people, and, and I'm just crying, and I'm overcome by, by something that God was doing in my heart. And a brother that I would soon realize was going to be my roommate, um, from Brazil comes up behind me, he didn't know me, and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, the Lord wants you to forgive someone. And, and I said, who are you? <laughs> uh, but without saying that out of my mouth, I said that in my head. Um, I knew exactly who I needed to forgive. I needed to forgive my mother. And I proceeded to just let some things from my mother go because I was from a single parent home and I had a lot of stuff go on, which we don't have time to really talk about. Distractions, obstacles. God will not let you go, all right? Again, on the same mission trip, I had my earring, I said. A uh, brother came up to me and says, you're going to have to take that. He's from Columbia. Didn't know him. He was leading the outreach to the community. He says, you're going to have to take your earring out of your ear. I said, why am I going to take my earring out of my ear? Um, he says, because people in Peru, they'll see your earring and they'll not talk to you. It's a, considered a, a rebellious thing. And I wasn't there to change the cultural perception of my appearance. What I was there to do was pre preach the gospel. And if, in fact, I go there to stand my ground on my position on why I had an earring in my ear, what am I doing? Am I there for God or am I there for me? So after that conversation had happened in my head for about, about a minute and a half, a little bit longer for that one, um, I finally put the earring in my pocket and I haven't returned it since. And that was 1989. Why do I tell you all that stuff? Because God wants a hold of your heart all the time. We talked about this numerous times, all right? We are in, uh, in the topic of worship, but we have compartmentalized worship so much. We compartmentalize it to a room, to uh, a, a study, or, or even our own personal devotions. But when we go outside of the, that room or that box that we placed it in, we lose the reality that we are worshiping him with our lives. And we, I know th you guys got some great people here that with great hearts and, and good focus. And I've heard it from the mouths of the youth here that you guys want to worship the Lord with your life. So that's come out of mouths that I've heard today, this week. And I am so impressed. But that is what God wants us to do. He wants to remove those distractions so that we see everything as if it's a fixation on what God wants to do in our lives. Hebrews 12. We're going to go to Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. Some of my favorite stuff right here. 
Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and despised its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Write that in your notebook. Memorize it. Let it be something that propels you into each and every obstacle, each and every day that you make. When I think of Jesus being the fixation of our life, I think of a, of a weapon. And that crosshair that you have in the front of the weapon, all right, you want that fixed on wherever you're going to point it at and shoot, right? And each and every day of your life, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. You need to fix your eyes on him no matter what you're doing. Whether you're, we talked about it, going to work, whether I'm coming up here, whether you're going out to play, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Why? Because any other fixation will take you off course. It's going to take you down a wrong road. Hands down. And I love this runner's illustration. I'm a runner. I, I'd rather be, I told Jeffrey I'd rather be running 10 miles than come to a retreat sometimes because it's less energy spent than spending time. I, I'm exhausted. I don't know about you guys. I'm exhausted. We are in a race, and you need to take the stuff off. If I go to a race, I might run in something like this to warm up with, but guess what? When I'm racing, I'm racing in something different. I'm putting a singlet on. I'm not going to take off my shirt or anything. All right? These things come off. All right? I might t put a different set of shoes on, but I want to run fast, and I want to run with purpose. And you guys also sometimes carry too much baggage. We carry too much baggage. We carry stuff that we ought not to carry. I, I, mean, I love the military, but I used to, I mean, I, I used to train and teach a lot of, lot of pretty cool dudes, uh, about 65 people every six weeks would come through and they would want to be beat down for six weeks. So that was a fun three years of my life, um, really. <laughs> All right, uh, and they wanted it, um, to be quite honest. But they would do ruck running, where you put like heavy rucks, sometimes 35, sometimes 45, sometimes more. Crazy people do like more. I didn't do that. Um, but no more than 45 um, for, for running purposes. But typically you don't run with heavy loads. You gotta lighten up the load. And you and I also need to realize that that is something that we need. I'm going to share with you a quote. I'm all over the map, too, by the way. All right. Have you heard of the book Screw Tape Letters? All right. Yeah. I've heard Screw Tape. Uh, Luca, where are you? You mentioned Screw Tape, didn't you? Yeah. Um, screw tape letters, I, I obviously, by the condition of my book, it's pretty beaten up, you know. It's not the Bible. It's extra biblical. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He wrote a bunch of things. But this one thing he says in chapter, <coughs> chapter 4, and remember what's happening here. You probably, if you've never read it, I'm just going to give you the, the really back cover version of this. Um, C.S. Lewis is writing this letter that's uh, actually from uh, a demon to a lesser demon, all right? Very controversial book when it was written, all right? So that's what's going on. So the demon is screw tape, the wormwood is his lesser demon, and the patient is a person that's a Christian, okay? So I have known cases where what the patient calls his God was actually located up and to the left at the corner of the bedroom ceiling or inside his own head or in a crucifix on the wall 
But whatever the nature of the composite object, you must keep him praying to it, to the thing that he has made, not to the person who has made it. You may even encourage him to attach great importance to the correct correction and improvement of his composite object and to keep it steadily before his imagination during the whole prayer for if we even if he even comes to make the distinction if ever he can consciously directs his prayers not to what what i think thou ought art but to what thou knowest thyself to be our situation is for the most moment desperate once all his thoughts and Im images have been flung aside or, if retained, retained with a full recognition of their merely subjective nature, and the man trusts himself to be completely real, external, invisible presence there with him in the room and never knowable by him as he is known by it. Why? Then it is that the incalculable may occur. That is a big section. But what is he saying there in the, that little text is this. Sometimes our distractions are from objects, from thoughts in our heads, from ourselves, from things around us. All right? And we can even have shrines or moments in time that we fixate ourselves on that keep us focused on anything but God himself. And so I didn't want to necessarily confuse you with a lot of that language in that book, but I do want you to understand that your only focus is to be on Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. If he's the author, that means he began it. If he's the perfecter of your faith, that means he's going to complete it who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's where your confidence lies, and that's where it always needs to remain. Because I look around, and let's go to second, uh, 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to close with um, this right here. First Corinthians. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians? Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The God that you and I serve, he wants you exclusively. He is a jealous God, and anything that is before him or between you and he he's going to want to remove listen to what paul says about this um, when it comes to his concern for the corinthians over the the competition of the false prophets and apostles we'll just start with verse 11 uh, chapter 11 verse 1 oh that you would bear with me in a little folly and indeed you do bear with me for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may, may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he has come preach, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. With it. And that's going to that's be where I stop for now, verse 1 to 4. All right. Um, there is a battle over you guys. I tell this to my kids every day. Even now, even in my jumping around with, with the scriptures, even with some of the things that I'm having you write down, going from text to text, sometimes that's like a distraction. You know, sometimes it's the way somebody sounds. Sometimes it's something that you're doing. But 
Satan is always at battle, and he's a, and he's a, a he's not a he's not really original, all right. Um, he knows what you like. If he if he knows you like oranges, he's not going to give you a grape. If he knows like you like apples, he's not going to give you a, a, a pear. And Satan knows exactly how to get right at you to follow after his um, lure, if you will. But he is in battle over you. I tell my kids this. We're praying for you. When I say that I am, I am, I see you guys and I, and I, I see just this desire to will you into a relationship with the Lord and will you into a walk that's fruitful, will you into something that God wants for you, but I can't do that. Paul is expressing here about the Corinthians, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Godly jealousy. Parents in the back, all right, you guys have a, a, a care for your kids that's unlike anything that I have for these kids. We have a, a, a concern for our kids to grow up, and when they go astray, it breaks our hearts. But if you can take this moment and pan up to God, so let's pan out and pan up to God, and he sees all the hearts of all the people that have chosen to follow him, and he sees the directions they're taking, and he's heartbroken by the decisions that are made over and over again to do the wrong thing. We need to have a moment right now to come back to the heart of worship. And I'm going to have Kaylin come up right now. My, um, as he's coming up, I asked him to play the song. Did I say your name right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I asked him to play the song because it's been put on my heart. This topic is a broad one. That's why I gave you all the study notes. All right? Uh, it, and, and the topic of worship is broad. But at the end of the whole conversation, you have a decision right now, all right, to refocus, to refocus on the Lord and let him be the one in your crosshairs right now, all right? Not me. And I, I'm not saying close your eyes and look somewhere else, okay? But... I want you to really take this moment as this song is played to really fix your eyes on Jesus. Let him be your primary focus that leads you out of here. When you go to a convenience store, you're going there with Jesus in your crosshairs. If somebody gets between you and Jesus, guess what? They're casualties of goodness, of godliness, because they should see you following Jesus. They should see you following Jesus. If they don't see you following Jesus, what are they seeing? What kind of representative are you? If you're being distracted by your attitude, if you're being distracted by your distractions, by yourself, by other things and idols, what kind of witness are you being? What kind of representation are you for Jesus Christ? This is what I want you to ponder as the song's played, as you sing the song. Let the Lord just soften you by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been praying for this retreat for a long time. We've been praying for you.